We've seen several anti-satellite tests in the last couple of years, and this has demonstrated that an aircraft with the right kind of rocket can deploy a missile that can, with precision, destroy a satellite. Now, these have all been tests where nations have been destroying their own satellites, but the consequences have been severe. We're seeing clouds of debris in orbit that is threatening almost every satellite and spacecraft that is in the same range. Like, this is a big problem. People should stop doing this. It's possible that we could see even more threatening weapons both launched from Earth as well as deployed in space. Now, there are agreements to design to prevent that, but then there are people who don't follow agreements. And so we're entering a very complicated phase, both kind of in the near term, but also in the far, far term. Think about as humanity moves off of Earth and goes out into space and starts to set up on other worlds, how do the balances of power shift and change? So to talk about this with me today, my guest is Dr. Matthew Powell. He is a teaching fellow in air power and strategic studies at the University of Portsmouth in the UK. He wrote a piece recently about sort of how the consequences of anti-satellite weaponry is not just to destroy the satellite, but really to create this veil of debris around planet Earth that we will all be suffering the consequences from. And that moving into this era where now people can destroy satellites and also create space debris, we need new agreements. And in fact, the Outer Space Treaty is coming up for renegotiation in a few years. Now would be a good time to consider the implications of anti-satellite weaponry beyond anti not having space-based weaponry. So enjoy this fascinating conversation with Dr. Matthew Powell. Matthew, what did we learn? I guess, what did the White House tell us that they had learned that the Russians were up to? That's a really, really interesting question because I think the answer to that is probably not a lot in, in all seriousness. Um, the, the White House have actually been very, very quiet on this since they broke the story about um, what they had found out about um, Russian intentions with ASATs with potentially nuclear weapons or nuclear-powered ASATs. So it, it seems to be that they're trying to keep a lid on this perhaps because what they're really looking to do is to show up Russian capabilities as not quite being as strong as they are, that the Russians are trying to claim, certainly. Or it could be that they don't want to give this too much air at the moment, perhaps because of the fear it might cause, because of how people might react to, to such a thing, and that what they're trying to do is get out ahead of the story through their intelligence agencies, through the Department of Defence, to try and get more information so that they can actually put a, a reliable story out there and a reliable response to um, what the Russians have been claiming. Um, so it does all seem to have died down a little bit in terms of media response. So I, I think to go back to the initial start of the, the answer there, it's we don't know an awful lot more than we did a week or so ago when it first broke. So that, that, would, that would suggest to me that... There is there are things happening behind the scenes within perhaps the CIA, within Department of Defense, that is trying to figure this out. And no response from the White House, I think, would suggest that that, that is what's happening. It, it does seem very reminiscent of when we saw the first, the days and weeks and months before the invasion of Ukraine, that that there was just kind of a, a looming warning without necessarily a lot of specifics, but it was enough for people. To, and it ended up being exactly right. Um, and so, and I don't, this doesn't feel like the same kind of thing. This feels like a, a more general concern about a new type of warfare that should be on everybody's radar as opposed to necessarily, you know, yeah, this is I, I, I think that's right. And I, I think to sort of take the, the first part of, of what you just said there, I, I think sort of the American and the West response more generally to the looming threat over uh, with regards to Ukraine two years ago was almost trying to show the Russians that we know exactly what you're doing. We've got this information. We're not going to give you the specifics because then you might find out either how or who we got this information off and, and we'd quite like to keep that under wraps so that we can carry on getting that information. But just enough for them to be aware, we know what you're planning. We can see the buildup of the forces this is going to be a big international incident if you do. And I think that was perhaps an attempt to try and get Russia to back down in what they were doing. Um, obviously, that 
failed spectacularly, um, particularly as far as Ukraine is concerned. Um, so I, th- I think this sort of this degree of using intelligence as a form of politics that, that we saw a couple of years ago, which is a really interesting take on how to use intelligence and to make those difficult decisions as to when you release information, when you put it into the public domain and when you keep it within the sort of the sacred circle of political decision makers, intelligence operatives. And that, that's a, a real challenge um, for intelligence agencies. And there have been plenty of instances I, I know from um, covert operations that were conducted where people entered into the Irish Republican Army, for example, the information that was coming back was enough to stop attacks from taking place either in uh, Northern Ireland or in on British territory, but that they wouldn't act on it because it would give away who this source was. And so it's a difficult um, political decision, but also a difficult moral decision as well, I think, to, to, to sort of um, make these judgment calls. How far are you willing to let people get injured, to get killed? Um, but to go to the second part of what you said, this does feel quite different. This is actually talking in a few more specifics about what the Russians might be trying to do in in the space domain, which they they have activity in space, but they're not probably I would say the biggest space player on the planet at the moment. Um, so this is definitely I think the Russians trying to enhance their capabilities, trying to put pressure on other nation states in space. One of the challenges I think that you're going to find with that from a Russian perspective and from the Kremlin's point of view is that you could go upsetting some of the people who've been quite friendly to you since the invasion of Ukraine in India and China. Um, If you're going to launch things like an anti-satellite missile, if you're going to try and create disturbances in space and add to the debris that already exists up there and the the International Space Station has had to move on several occasions to avoid even the tiniest um, flecks of debris, you're going to put their assets at risk as well. And that's going to cause tension between governments, between ambassadors and foreign secretaries, foreign ministers. So again, it, it's difficult to tell without any more information coming out, but it does feel as if the US are trying to ramp up the pressure on Russia in other ways. Perhaps they're seeing that the sanctions that they're imposing on Putin, on other members of the Russian government, members of the Russian military, and not having the effect that they would want. We saw that um, Russia has effectively turned into a war economy over the last year, 18 months. 40% of its economic output now is going towards supporting the war in Ukraine, which is absolutely huge for what is in you know military terms a relatively minor conflict. Um, so this, this could be a way of trying to put pressure on, trying to turn allies against the Russians, trying to get them to think twice before supporting them. If they're going to act like this, then everybody's at risk. There's a, a theory that's emerged from uh, nuclear deterrence of mutually assured destruction. And we, we all understand that in terms of nuclear weapons. If you fire one, you've essentially already lost because the response you're going to expect is going to be similar in nature. Academics that look at this, practitioners who look at this, have started to apply that theory to the space domain as well. Because if you destroy even your own satellite, and the Chinese did this, I think, back in 2017, they cause a huge amount of debris. Yeah, now- yeah. So, and that's what I want to talk about then is sort of this idea of sort of, I guess, how would, what kinds of weapons in the space domain are people considering? And I think, you know, we're, we're familiar with the anti-satellite weapons. You mentioned the test that's been done. I mean, the U.S. has done the test. The Chinese have done a test. The Indians have done a test. The Russians have done a test. Um, and the, the outcome is always the same, which is increased hazard for everybody. So, so where are we at with that? So I, I think you're right in what you said, that the, the four major space nations, um, I certainly couldn't count my own nation, the UK, as a major space nation. We're sort of a, really, a real bit part player in that. Um, it's often said that I think we're about five years behind whatever the US are doing in space, which gives some ideas to you know the differences that exist in the world now um, in terms of the, the top tier of space nations. Yeah, we just supply robotic arms to yeah. various yeah. space space stations. So, um, but yeah, so like, I mean, at this point, they've all, all of these nations have had their chance at, at firing their. So, what have they learned? 
I think they've learned that it's possible. And, and I think that's one of the really important things when it comes to any new weapon system is to discover, can you actually do this? You, you can work out the theory, you can get your engineers, your physicists, your scientists to to tell you the theory that we can fire a weapon from Earth into space and we can be accurate in what we hit. But you actually need to be able to demonstrate that capability, not only to show that you can do it, but to show your adversaries that you can do it. it it's all well and good coming out and saying that you, you've got this theoretical capability until you actually prove it, no one is going to believe you. But what were the consequences? So the consequences were that you don't have to weaponize space. So you don't have to break the Outer Space Treaty, which states that you cannot put weapons in space. So it means that now the space domain has become more vulnerable. I think it's the, it's the real takeaway hmm. here, that the assets can be targeted. They can be destroyed from the Earth. Is it technically complex? Is it very expensive? Is it worth the time, effort and money to do it? Possibly not. But to have that in your back pocket is quite useful when you enter into international negotiations around these things. It's also going to, I think, really shape the negotiations for the new Outer Space Treaty, because um, the Outer Space Treaty and the Lunar Treaties both expire in the next five to 10 years. And so through the UN, they're going to have to get together and renegotiate these treaties because there was a time limit on them. So they will expire in, I think, the next five to 10 years, possibly. And now that space has become more important to India, China, the US, Russia, there's going to be a lot more competition. The negotiation is going to be a lot more difficult as to what you can and cannot do in space. So you cannot put weapons into space. You can't use things like lasers to try and target other people's assets. What will the new treaty look like? So what we're going to see is how do nations react to this? And the fact that you can attack assets from Earth perhaps makes the whole idea of weaponizing space redundant. You don't need to be able to do it. But of course, I think everyone gets fixated on this idea of the anti-satellite missile and the ability to destroy something in space from earth because it's cool it's you know it's exciting in a, in its own certain way it grabs people's attention but you don't need to be able to destroy an asset physically in space to be able to make it as unserviceable to be able to stop it from working you can hack into the communication feed between space and earth through cyber attacks and that's probably a much more efficient way of doing things drawback with going through a cyber method is you're seeking weaknesses and once you've conducted an attack you've then highlighted to your opponent the weaknesses in their system that they will look to fill very very quickly and so it's almost a, a, a one-shot attempt and then you've got to go back and perhaps work for months or years to get another chance I mean, it feels like you're you're working with incredible precision. You have this one satellite that has this, you know, that is providing data on the battlefield to the enemy. It makes sense to knock that satellite out of operation, and then you're denying your opponent information. But and it is the equivalent of you, I don't know, dropping a bomb on one specific radar vehicle that's that's out there in the field. But it's not that you are when you do that, you are now filling. It would be the equivalent of you know after you destroy that radar truck, you're now having uh, supersonic bullets go around the planet endlessly in all directions forever or for five years, right? Like like it is not what you think, and so. You know, what did we learn were sort of the, the physical consequences of even just these tests? Um, space debris was already cluttering up low Earth orbit before any of these tests occurred. Now it's getting to proportions where it could potentially become dangerous. And this is the real challenge. And part of the Outer Space Treaty actually states that nations who create space debris are responsible for removing it. Problem with Good international with law. That. Yeah, that's the problem with international law is that we all we all agree with these things in exactly the same way as all all nations that sign up to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty agree that they should work together to reduce and then finally remove their stocks and arsenals of nuclear weapons. 
the British have signed up to this. The Americans have signed up to this. I'm pretty sure the Russians have signed up to this. But we're quite happy for the other side to go first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if if you uh, – there was a study that I recently reported on. There's something like tens of millions of pieces of debris mm -hmm. that are a millimeter or larger yep. out there in space. And each one, if you wanted to remove that paint fleck that could take a satellite out, you would need to launch a whole other satellite to, ch you know, yeah. to chase it down and grab it and deorbit and add more space debris. Like we're going to have to wait potentially decades for this debris to reenter the Earth's atmosphere. Some of it. If, if it ever does. Years. If it if ever does. Yeah, centuries. Yeah, it may, it may never do. And there are steps that people are looking at to try and reduce the amount of space debris. So, there are plans to send up um, spacecraft with nets to try and grab some of this debris and bring it back to Earth. Um, redundant satellites, there's talk of trying to tip them out of their orbital pattern and then <clears throat> push them into <clears throat> outer space. And if that's what we're planning to do, <clears throat> I just hope we don't land, send it to a planet with extraterrestrial life on it because that might not go down so well. Um, lasers are being talked about as well to try and burn it up or trying to push it back into the atmosphere. It's possible theoretically, and I think there have been experiments where it's been trialed, but it's nowhere near on a large enough scale. And th those pieces that you mentioned, you know, a, a millimeter in in length is nothing. We would <clears throat> that's we wouldn't consider that on Earth, but the speed at which it is going it can cause catastrophic damage. And you look at how reliant society, perhaps Western society is a better example of this, on certain um, satellite assets that are up there, like global positioning system satellites. You look at how much of our daily life relies on those assets to remain safe, to remain functioning. Um if one of those were to be destroyed, we couldn't have this chat right now in two different on two different continents. The the internet just wouldn't work. And you think how yeah. And you think how much of our daily life revolves around a computer, a smartphone, a tablet, the ability to find answers straight away. I, I'm still just about young enough to remember not knowing something and going down to the local library and finding things out. Now, if I want to find something out, it's a quick tap on your phone and you can get whatever answers that you want. How we interact with people, social media. We think we think back to the pandemic and the lockdowns that we suffered and how important the internet was to maintaining relationships with friends and family that you couldn't see. You take all of that away, that's just one aspect. But the global banking system relies on GPS power generation relies on gps something as simple as just finding your way in your car using your your sat nav so the, so you know specifically i mean we're talking about these anti anti satellite weapons that are launched from earth but i think what the rumor mill was proposing was that these might not be ground based anti satellite mm. systems but per perhaps space based anti satellite mm weapons. So what would a space-based anti-satellite weapon look like? What would it be? It's a really good question. I, I would, again, not knowing the details, it's difficult to give definitive answers. But well, I we have say, tests of them, right? I mean, the Americans and the Russians yeah. tested space-based anti-satellite weapons back in the 1960s. So we kind of know yeah. how, you, how you do this. We we know we know how to do it. We've sort of done the tests on Earth, so we know what you need. I think the the first thing that I, I would think of when it comes to a space based anti satellite missile would be its weight and its payload. It's except it's still exceptionally expensive to put things into space, and every gram the extra that you have is going to make that more expensive, perhaps even less reliable to actually put the asset into space because we, we still, you know, we can see from um, scientific space missions that even launching something is still a major challenge. It's not something that you can get right time after time after time. So I would have thought in terms of payload and sort of the, the warhead that's on there, 
it's going to be relatively small compared to what you might be able to do as a, with an anti-satellite missile launched from Earth. So it's not going to have as much destructive power. So, so I mean, like back in the, you know, the thing that I'm talking about back in the, in the 1960s, the, the Americans tested high altitude nuclear weapons in space mm -hmm. to generate that electromagnetic pulse that, and they found it surprisingly effective for knocking out electrical systems, even mm -hmm. upwards of a thousand kilometers away from where the, the detonation happened. So, so you're saying that, that even if they want to go with a, say an EMP, it'll still be probably a ground-based weapon that will be fired into space. I, I think that's more than likely simply because of the technical challenges. And I, and I think if they, if they ha if the Russians have been successful and the Americans confirm um, and sort of give us some more details on what, what they've discovered, what, the, what they've um, worked out with all of this, that that's when we'll know the real dangers. Um, I, the challenge is if you launch something into space or from space to an, another space asset, nobody's really done that in space before. So we don't know how you would control it, how you would aim it, what you would aim for, that kind of thing. So it would be sort of really opening that envelope to find out, okay, what does this look like? Um, let's say you miss you might not hit anything. It might just fly off into the, the deeper realms of the universe, never to be seen again. <clears throat> it might hit the Russian's own equivalent of GPS. It might hit the Chinese. And we come back to what we discussed uh, at the start, where we sort of, the, the, the unknowns, are perhaps the scariest part here. How would a, an anti-satellite missile react in space? We've got an idea from things like the um, International Space Station and the, the shuttles that have been sent up by NASA. So we know the physics, we know how to do it, but nobody's tried it with this. And you can have all the theory in the world until you've actually put it into practice. That's where you start to learn and start to understand. Um, does the outer, I mean, does the outer space treaty specifically prohibit, I mean, I guess you can't do tests like, like the whole atmospheric, the partial test ban that came before the Outer Space Treaty was very clear that you can't test nuclear weapons in the atmosphere or in, in outer space. So so you are prohibited from from testing a weapon in space now. Yeah, and the Outer Space Treaty states the same and also says that you can't weaponize space. Now, unfortunately, right. like all inter in international law, you actually have to be able to apply it. Right. And so when you say you can't weaponize space, and you can't, say, put a nuclear weapon into a satellite, launch it, have it fly around, and then at, at a, the time when you want, have it detonate and take out nearby satellites with its yeah. EMP. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's what the law says. But international law also says that you can't invade another country. Right. Yes. So it's the challenge of it's you what can't the law overfish says. Overfish in international waters, and there's all kinds of things you're not supposed a to do. Absolutely, you can have as many laws as you want. You have to be able to apply them. And how do you prevent a nation like Russia, or even China, Russia, the US, India? How do you actually stop these nations from doing it? And this is one of the real challenges of the international system and why when you speak to international relations scholars, the majority of them will describe the international political system as anarchic. There are no rules. There's no mechanism to stop anybody if they wanted to putting that weapon into space, apart from the diplomatic pressure, perhaps the sanctions, perhaps the, the political uh, rigmarole that they'll go through. But if a nation is willing to accept that, Absolutely. There, there's nothing in on the earth. There's nothing, there isn't anything that will stop them from doing it. So Russia may feel that this is a way of threatening the US, of putting them under more pressure to try and withdraw the support from Ukraine. And, and we've seen this before with Putin at the very start of the invasion two years ago. We saw that he put here, uh, Putin had put his strategic nuclear forces on high alert. I'm not sure that Putin is going to launch a nuclear weapon, but upping the ante at that point is sending a direct message to the US and to the West who are seeking to support Ukraine. If you do this, there could be horrific consequences for you.
And this could be a similar idea that if you continue with this support, we now have the capability to launch this weapon. OK, it may take out our assets, but it's going to hurt you just as much. And you're more reliant on this than we are. And the, the US um, are providing a huge amount of intelligence from um, reconnaissance in space to the Ukrainians. And so this could be that sort of thing, again, trying to up the ante and trying to just put that little bit more pressure on. He can see that there's fractures in Congress between the Republicans and the Democrats over the support for Ukraine and continuing it and the cost and the weapons that are being sent. Perhaps this is a way of trying to open up that divide a little bit more, create fear in the populace that well, what would be the consequences if a GPS satellite was to be taken out how might that affect the ability to just live your daily life? And it caught then forces whoever is president, Biden at the moment, but whoever becomes president um, next year, to perhaps think again about what they're doing and how they're going to do it. And so it's a really interesting political dynamic at play as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's talk about this idea of like the next version of the Outer Space Treaty. I mean, we've learned a tremendous amount since the first treaty was signed back in the 1960s. It's been a long time. Um, what do you what do you think that that a new version of a I guess a renegotiated Outer Space Treaty will incorporate? And and I guess it's a bit of a different playing field this this time around because there are plenty of nations that signed it and were like we're never going to space who cares and now so many nations are in space. Yeah, so so I think that congested playing field is going to be a really difficult one. But I, I think to, there's perhaps an assumption both in your question and from people who look at this that we will get a renegotiated treaty. That there's nothing that says these nations have to agree another treaty. They they could just leave it open to anybody and everybody to do what they like, when they like, how they like. So that's the first challenge, is actually getting something written down that everybody can agree and is willing to sign. And with space being so much more important now to China, to Russia, and you know, as you said, the 1960s when the first one was signed, the only two major space powers were the US, were the, were the Soviet Union. And both of those didn't really have a capability to put a lot of weapons into space, but also saw how important it was that this remained a peaceful environment, that it was one for ex exploration, for advancing society, for advancing humanity, for understanding more, not only about the world in which we live, but outside of it, how it was formed. And that's why you have things like collaboration with the International Space Station, because there was a real desire for that scientific progress and that understanding and knowledge. Now space is much more competitive. And we can see how nations are seeking to use space to gain an advantage over their adversaries. And that is going to be, I think, the second challenge alongside that more congested playing field. You've got more voices in the room. You've got more areas for dissent, for disagreement. So I, I think it's going to be a real challenge to renegotiate this and to get something back into place. It may not look exactly the same. We may have to say that you can have um, satellites, perhaps nations, are, but they can only be used for defensive purposes. How you define defensive purposes is very, very difficult. As one of the, another one of the challenges of, of international law is that we can all agree on plenty of things, but we don't always necessarily ag agree on definitions. And th this is nothing new trying to reach these international agreements. If we look back to 1932, we had something called the Geneva Peace Conference and the Disarmament Conference that went along with it under the auspices of the League of Nations. And one of the ambitions of the disarmament conference was to ban offensive weapons. Now, what is an offensive weapon? Is artillery an offensive weapon or is it a defensive weapon? Is a rifle an offensive weapon? Is it defensive? And those talks took about 18 months to fall apart when they realised that as much as they could all agree with the sentiments and the principles behind this and that it was a really good idea, how are you defining it? It is something armed with a laser on a satellite. Is a satellite armed with a laser? Um, is it defensive in nature? Is it there to try and prevent your adversary in space from moving a sa their satellite 
accidentally on purpose. I don't think these things are done deliberately, but they're certainly not done accidentally. Just into the line of communication to Earth so that it blocks it. It happens. People put in the wrong coordinates. Things move. We didn't mean it, and we moved it as quickly as possible. But for those three or four hours, perhaps it took to move that satellite back across, you were perhaps without GPS. Yeah. Um, And a lot of the things that were very theoretical in the original Outer Space Treaty have become real tangible issues. When you think about um, the potential for mining resources in space, that has complicated issues about ownership. When you think about us exploring other worlds, there's concerns about planetary protection. And then, of course, there's these issues of, of polluting the environment, creating all of this, this space junk, which is already, in, you know, like this issue is not going to go away. It's getting worse every year. Yeah. Do you, does it feel like, like these will all be encapsulated together into a new version of the outer space treaty or are these going to have to be handled separately? Cause like, I know the U S is, is starting to come up with its own legislation for things like asteroid mining and planetary protection and things like that. So yeah, Where do you stand with I, that? again, I, it's going to be really difficult to tell. And my my profession is as a historian, and I, I always say, never ask a historian to predict the future because they're going to be more <laughs> wrong than anybody else. Um, right. I, I think that these issues now have become so big and so important to nations. Things like accessing the moon and perhaps building bases on the moon or trying to get to the moon to get the resources that are there, or even the asteroids that are sort of between here and Mars that contain a lot of the rare earth minerals that we require now for our push to green economies. And I think this is something that perhaps the US and the West might be more overly interested in than perhaps the Chinese, because the Chinese have pushed politically to gain access to these rare earth minerals in Africa. And that's part of their Belt and Road Initiative to sort of build infrastructure for developing African countries, but in return, our companies will come in and we'll extract the lithium and other rare, other rare minerals that are required to build the batteries that you need for electric cars. But again, if China sees this as a potential monopoly for them on Earth, they may want to restrict other nations' access to these asteroids so they don't lose, lose that leverage and power on Earth. Um, I, I think that they're going to have to be done in in separate treaties. I think that the issues are so big, are so important politically now that they're going to have to be dealt with separately. You can't just put them into a a general treaty. You're going to have to have something um, along the lines of perhaps the Lunar Treaty, um, which states that no nation state can claim sovereignty of the moon. So you might have to have something about shared sovereignty and respecting boundaries. We've got it with Antarctica, so it can work in theory, but not many people are interested in Antarctica. Lots of people are interested in the moon and what it might give you and the access, but also the, perhaps the ability to dominate. Um, you know, you talked about sort of the 1960s treaty and a lot of the things that were discussed in there being more science fiction than science fact. And when I discussed this with my students at the RF College here in the UK, and we asked them what might happen in space in the future. I asked them to use their imagination, but to look at films. And I think one of the best ones to ex- exemplify this idea of trying to dominate the Earth from space is Austin Powers, where Dr. Evil builds a laser on the moon. Now, that, that's theory. That probably isn't going to happen. But you think of the political advantage that it gives a nation state to have a weapon system on the moon. And I'm sure that that these nations are thinking about this. How are we going to do this? What are the technical difficulties? And of course, if one nation starts to weaponize the moon, other nations are going to try and weaponize it. You're going to look at a huge amount of competition over the moon, not just for the resources, not just to weaponize it. But we're seeing the moon now through companies like SpaceX, um, Virgin Galactic, although uh, when I had a business recently, and um, the Amazon spin-off, about using this as a way to advance to Mars. So, you know, if we extrapolate the likelihood or, or sort of what might happen and sort of play it with imaginations a little bit, you could start to see battles being fought on the moon. Entirely possibly. It, unlikely, I think, especially in the next sort of 50, 60 years, but why not? If, if you're going to use that, if you're going to start using the moon in that way, 
nations are going to compete over it. And when they compete, they're going to send forces to try and hold what they've got and try and prevent other people taking it or perhaps take more from them. It's interesting, you know, people talk about this idea of, say, going to Mars as a way to, uh, you know, split so we don't have all of our eggs in one basket, mm. that some of us live on Earth and some of us live on Mars or some of us live on the moon. And and on the one hand, that does provide some level of redundancy, but it also provides a certain level of unaccountability then at the same time, where, you know, right now we're all trapped here on Earth together. And so the the consequences that we have on our on our environment we share the outcome but if you live on mars you don't really care what happens to earth anymore so does that make it more dangerous um it's it's really interesting i think because we, we talk about this and, and i think so possibly the most dangerous part of going to mars is the time it's going to take for you to get there it, it's an awful long time to be in a small metal box with a few other people and of course, the first people, the pioneers that go to Mars in the first mission or few missions are never going to come back. Um, and it, there have actually been experiments that have been conducted in the last few years of putting people into a replica of a spacecraft that might go to Mars and locking them in for months on end just to see how people will cope psychologically with being in a small capsule with people that you can't escape from. What does that do to your mind? We experienced something similar in lockdown. Uh, I certainly know, um, having just recently got married before the lockdown happened, that when you can't escape, it changes the dynamics of how you deal and interact with people. Right. Because you've yeah. got nothing to talk about. But but I guess I guess what I'm asking is not sort of the the pioneer part of it, which is obviously going to be difficult and people are going to suffer and they're going to overcome immense hurdles and they're going to be completely dependent on earth. But if the dream becomes true that there is a self-sufficient city on Mars, there are giant rotating space stations in the Trojan belt, that there are these independent entities that, that are no longer dependent on earth, that they are completely independent on their own, suddenly it's kind of like the same as what we had on earth when people could move to different, you know, you have different nations that can, you know, interact with each other. And it's only when they came up with a weapon that risked everybody that people could finally have a, I don't know, a healthy conversation about not deploying those weapons. Yeah. And I, I think so setting up colonies on mars you need to start the legal framework from scratch yeah. and you need to have some way of applying it again as we talked about with international law there's a law in the uk against going over a certain speed limit and on certain roads people still speed people still get caught there's nothing to stop them doing it it's the consequences of what might happen to you that stop you breaking the law so, yeah, it, it's essentially you're trying to create a whole new society from scratch. And how how do you do that? We It's been such a long time. I think to, we see in, say, the US in the 1600s, that was an attempt to start a, a new society based around religious values. So what values do you take? What's going to be important to this new society? Is it going to be one based on greater freedoms? Is it going to be one not based on greater restrictions? Who enforces these laws? Who's in charge? Who's make sure that these laws are followed, that people actually do what they're being asked to do, what they're being, you know, what they require to do to survive? Because they're going to have to set up a colony. They're going to have to build shelters. They're going to have to have a way of sustaining themselves with food and water. So who does that? And I'm, I think that we've reached a point, perhaps, in sort of the history of mankind where that might be more difficult, where we've become much more individualistic in nature and that that idea of working together is much more difficult. How do you resolve disputes? Do, do you let people do it through violence or do you have some kind of system? You know, Are people still citizens of their own nation? If you have several nations that go to Mars in several trips, does their law apply on Mars or on the moon? Or do you have a whole new set of legal frameworks? Um, and then how, how do these people adjust to that situation of leaving yeah, everything I mean, I think, behind? 
in the in like in the near term, you have leverage over the over the people who have because if if you if you don't send the regular supplies to them, then then they starve, and yeah. then eventually, if they can build up a certain level of of self sufficiency, and then start to make demands for their for their own rights, and 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 be a completely independent space nation state, mm-hmm. um, then. Then I think, but but and I guess what I'm saying is that that's when you then enter that realm of risk again. For in the yeah. short term, you have leverage. In the long term, you lose that leverage, and now you've got space weapons where Martians don't care about space junk in Earth yeah. orbit. They don't care about the damage to the environment on planet Earth. Suddenly, what you thought was the ability to to put your eggs into multiple baskets ter- actually turns into a, a time and a place of increasing risk for, for everybody involved because you no longer have this shared space until you realize that we're ruining the space stage, the space, the solar system environment. And then we come together, you know, with a yeah. new set of treaties. Yeah. Uh, and uh, at what point do you stop? If you, you can get to Mars, can you, in theory, do something like in Star Trek, where you can just fly around forever and sustain yourself and keep moving on? And is this a, a perpetual problem? Okay, we, we've ruined Earth. The environment's not very good. We've got global warming. Weather patterns have been destroyed. We've lost huge land masses. People can't afford to, um, aren't able to sustain themselves in certain parts of the globe. So, if we all up sticks and move to Mars, will we do the same? And and then yeah, at, at what point do politicians realise that they have lost that control? And then do you start sending people who can try and regain that control? And how do you do it over such vast distances? Yeah, well, I think it was reasons- interesting in the expand. I don't know if you read the Expanse books or watched the TV show, but they're sort of like they they cover this really well with sort of the interactions with the Martians. So the Martians have have stealth rail guns that they have in in solar orbit that are that at the time they want they can power them up and they can deliver a a kill shot at earth and then the earthlings have something similar and it's just a matter of you know and you have a certain amount of time before the signal is sent and the and the rail guns come online and they fire their 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 weapons and so it's this it's sort of it's back to the same idea right now that you have this 45 minute delay from when the launch happens to when the nuclear, so which is enough time for mutually assured destruction, and yeah. and and you can sort of imagine various iterations of that in space. And I and and I, I guess for me it feels like when we go to space, we're going to take us with us, yeah. right? And everything that we've thought about how to be jerks to each other down here on planet Earth, we're going to do the same when we go to space. And so hopefully we can sign proper treaties let's do a good job of this now today for, so it lasts forever yeah, yeah I, I i think so i, I think to, the, the two challenges with that the first is actually applying it but i'm i, I would i get the impression that when the, the first treaties were signed in the 1960s that they felt that okay we'll put a deadline a time limit on this but the, we'll, we'll be in a position where we can come together again and we space won't be that important that we won't reach an agreement. Things have developed, so, things have moved on. So for, for your work with the RAF and, you know, I don't want to go into too much details necessarily specifics, but sort of is space a consideration for people who are coming through the military these days? Is there a certain amount of training that's done to at least sort of imagine how reliant they are on space? Yeah, so we we teach a little bit on space and we teach a little bit on cyber because these are two areas that the RAF have identified as important to them for future proofing, um, for being able to conduct operations. All three domains on Earth are reliant on the information that space gives, either in terms of intelligence from reconnaissance or just the ability to communicate. Um, Talked about the importance of GPS I don't think any military operation could be conducted today by the West without some form of GPS. It, if that goes, they are really, they are blind. They, you're back to navigators navigating with maps and pencils, trying to figure out where they are on the Earth. Um, so yeah, the the RAF see this as, as really really important. 
but the RAF faces quite a few challenges when it comes to developing its space capability, but also getting you the message out. So there's a, a lot of people in the RAF know about space and know that they could work in space in terms of working in the RAF, but it's not well advertised to the wider general public. And one of the things that we often discuss in our classrooms is, should the RAF rename itself to the Royal Air and Space Force? And I, I think that's a really easy way and relatively quick and cheap way of advertising to the general public and to the world, we are serious space players. We want to be involved in this. What it also does, and a lot of my work is based on historic air land integration and the arguments between army and air over who should own assets and who should direct and who should control things. It blocks off the army and the navy from being able to become more involved in space. If they put it in their name, it becomes theirs and they can use that as a springboard. So they are the RF are starting to advertise on TV about, you know, we, we work in space, we can do things in space. How much they do in space is debatable. They're not a big space, military space force. Um, but it's, it's certainly something that our cadets are interested in. They, they, they find this whole thing fascinating. They, they want to know more. So we try and push them in different directions as to what this might mean. And we tend not to talk about the physics and the science behind it. We're more interested in the military application, the international politics, as we've discussed today on this that I, for me, as a <clears throat> excuse me, military historian, I find much more interesting. I, science was never my subject when I was growing up in school, when I went through university. But the politics, the international relations, the military ap- applicability of space, how is it going to be used? What can we see developing? And that's what we try to bring in is what roles might develop in the future. We might see in similar um, ways to air mobility, the ability to move people and equipment around the world. Might we see space mobility? We see that the price of getting into space is coming down, even though it is still quite high um, in nominal terms. What, What will space look like in the next 20, 30 years? Will it become so congested that nobody can use it? And that's when we start taking the space debris more seriously. Will it take a catastrophic mistake or accident for something to hit the international space station or something to hit somebody's satellite will it take something like a commercial satellite being taken out something like satellite tv and taking that away from people for people to start taking this seriously because i think what we see at the moment are nations are quite willing to pay lip service to the idea of decongesting space and taking away the space debris but nobody's doing it. We haven't had an event catastrophic enough yet for people to say, actually, no, this is something we really need to do something about. And I think until that happens, everyone is quite prepared to take the risk. It's not going to be me. (laughs) It's not going to happen to us. So Matthew, what are you obsessed with right now? What am I obsessed with right now? My research at the moment is the British aircraft industry between 1919 and 1939. Hmm. That's my current research focus. That's what I'm looking at. It's not been heavily written on, so there's a nice big gap in the literature for me to try and um, to fill and to sort of publish on. Um, But that's dragged me in all sorts of directions I, I really didn't expect. So give me an interesting anecdote from what you found so far. So an interesting anecdote. Or, I found you know, interesting- a fi- I found a file in our national archives down in London during the rearmament phase in about 1938, in which the Air Ministry said that whenever we get a delivery estimate on an aircraft from one of our suppliers, we automatically add at least six m- months on because that's how late they usually are in delivering the first batch to us. Right, And that, that, that's dragged me into contemporary defence procurement where the same challenges and same huh. problems still exist. Um, I spent today actually writing up a chapter on the comparisons between historic and contemporary defence procurement. And, you know, a lot of the contemporary literature is saying we need these reforms, we need this change, we need that change. And with my historical knowledge, I've read it and thought, yeah, they've tried that and it didn't work. Yeah. My, my rule is always to double and add 10 
Yeah. And so whenever anybody tells me a number of how long something's going to take, it just in my mind yeah. is double and add 10. And that's, and you know, it could be, if they tell me it's going to be days then I double it and, and add 10 yeah. and then days, if they tell me it's weeks, if they tell me it's months, yeah. if they tell me it's years. Yeah. Um, and it tends to, it tends to work. Um, it, it's funny. So, so when I was a kid growing up in Canada, one of the big stories that they told us about a lot was the supply of the mosquito to World War II that we had this big logging industry in Canada and they were making, supplying wood for yep. like all of the lumber for these wooden airplanes yep. that were being, you know, helped win the Battle of Britain. Um, not so much the Battle of Britain. The Mosquito is used as a Pathfinder aircraft. So mm. because it was light and relatively quick, it was used alongside heavy bombers like the Avro Lancaster. Mm, okay to go in and it would drop um, lighted flares to help illuminate the target because Germany had implemented a blackout. So it was difficult to find the target. And one of the stats that's come out of um, sort of hit the research into the bombing offensive is in 1941, um, the British government and the RAF do an investigation into the accuracy rates of uh, bombers because about 90% of crews are coming back and saying, we dropped our bombs on target, but German production, German um, industry, isn't, the output isn't, isn't really being affected. So they send photo reconnaissance aircraft over afterwards to assess the damage and to try and find out where the bombs dropped. And they came to the conclusion that on average, if there was a full moon, then one in five crews would drop their bombs on target. A partial moon, it was one in 10, and a f no moon at all, it was down to an average of one in 15. And their definition of on target was within five miles of the target. So you could say factory in town X is your target. If you land it anywhere within five miles of that, you are on target. And one in 15 crews without a moon wasn't landing. So the Mosquito is part of this force to try and identify the target and drop these flares to guide in the heavy four engine bombers um, to drop their bombs. And they use a mix of incendiary and high explosives to try and create as many fires as possible, again, yeah, to illuminate yeah. the target and put pressure on the emergency services in these German towns and cities. Yeah, they didn't go into that level of detail when I was a kid. No, no. <laughs> Interestingly enough, some of the research, some of the files I've found recently from about 1936, 37, RAF missions are being sent over to Canada to see if the Canadian aircraft industry has got spare capacity to start supplying aircraft to Britain. That's how much they were struggling in the late 1930s before World War II. So they're going off to America, they're going off to Australia, they're going off to Canada, they're looking at all sorts of sources of supply to try and build up the RAF as much as they possibly can. Yeah, in an, altern in an alternate universe, I'm a historian and not a space journalist. I find this stuff so interesting and, and read a tremendous amount. Matthew, thank you so much for your time chatting with me today. And here's to a peaceful future. Absolutely. I would concur with that. And thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Matthew Powell. I'm going to talk about it some more. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Stephen Filler Munley, Paul Rohrbach, Abe Kingston, Hey Twilight, Dougie Stewart, Stephen Krasaki, David Richards, Mark Anstis, Joel Yancey, and Tony Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Vlad Shipland, Modso, George, David Gilton, and Andrew M. Gross, Jeremy Mattern, Josh Schultz, and Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. I think you got from the conversation that having anti-satellite weapons would be a very bad thing, that you just can't control the consequences of destroying an enemy satellite. Even if it's really important to remove it from the battlefield, you then have to deal with debris that is orbiting around the Earth. It's going to take out your other satellites. It's completely random. It harms your space operations as much as it harms your enemy space operations. This is the kind of weapon that needs to be considered the same level of severity as nuclear weapons, as chemical weapons, biological weapons, that the consequences are unforeseen and that they will affect the shared commons that we have of our space environment and will have impacts for humanity for years, decades, centuries, maybe even millennia down the road, and that we need to sign agreements today with teeth that will make sure that we can live in a future where we have an easy access to space, where we don't have to worry about space debris constantly tearing up our satellites and bringing them back down to Earth. So 
if you're a politician, you're watching this, please sign a better outer space treaty for the future of humanity in space. All right, we'll see you next time.